Hi again, Mark here from TalkingBass.net. This week I'm going to be taking you through the difference between arpeggios, scales and chromatic notes and explaining how you can apply them to all the bass lines and melodies that you play. If you've not been over to TalkingBass.net then go check it out. You can download the lesson material for this video and all the others by visiting the lesson map where all the lessons are arranged in a progressive and systemized list. Also, subscribe for free to gain access to a whole load of exclusive bass resources. You can download any of the free ebooks like the Scale Reference Manual. There's a forum, there's a practice room containing a whole load of uh, other practice resources, and there's also a courses page where I'm going to be adding more and more exclusive lessons over time. So, go check it out. Now, if you've watched many online bass video lessons on YouTube like this, you'll have noticed all the teachers like myself harping on and on and on about the importance of chord tones. But you might be thinking to yourself, why is it all about chord tones? You know, I hear things outside of chord tones all the time. And what are all these scales about? You know, I hear people running around on scales and people write books about scales. And what are all these chromatic notes that all these jazzers talk about? You know, etc, etc, etc. Well, you're right. Pretty much all music contains, contains notes other than arpeggios. So I'm going to explain what the deal is with all this and now you can start to see musical lines, be it bass lines or melodies, in a whole new light. So as you may or may not know, an arpeggio is a chord played one note at a time. So here's a C major chord and here's a C major arpeggio. So just that chord, one note at a time. And this is why arpeggio notes are often referred to as chord tones. I think we differentiate between chord tones and arpeggios a little because the term arpeggio conjures up visions of classical music or maybe rock guitarists like Ingvar Malmsteen playing sweep arpeggios really fast like, you know. The term chord tone treats the note of the chord as a separate entity, so we're less preoccupied with learning them as a, you know, a shape that goes up and down from the root. Chord tones are best applied into bass lines when we see them as these individual notes related to that root note. But either way, the main thing to realise is that arpeggios and chord tones are one and the same thing. So just think, chord tones, arpeggios, same thing. Now most music that we play is made up of chord progressions. So we have chords moving from one to another. And it doesn't matter whether these chords are played as block chords, you know, by an instrument like a guitar or a piano, or whether they're broken chords like this. Or even whether the chords just implied, you know, by several melodies all working together in counterpoint. The basic concept is that of harmony. So we have this kind of general harmonic uh, background and everything else works in relation to that. That's why in a band, a guitarist might come up with the chords, you know, that sound cool, and then a singer might come up with a melody that sounds good over those chords. And then you as a bass player might, you know, come up with a bass line that works with those chords. We might play the root notes, weave a line through them maybe, but the chords are the background upon which we put all the other moving parts. And this is really important to understand because a change of the chords is going to completely change how that melody or bass line, you know, will sound. And so that dictates whether or not we have to adjust the other notes or not. So the underlying idea here is that the harmony is the background of this musical painting. So when we decide to create a bass line or a melody, the notes within those chords, the chord tones, are going to be the main framework around which everything else is going to sit. The chord tones are always going to work and they're always going to sound okay because they're already in the chords. So if you have a C major chord, C, E, G, we can play a C, you know, in the melody or in a bass line and it's going to work because it's going to blend with that C. The E, that's going to blend with the E, the G, that's going to blend with the G. So I know it sounds very obvious, you know, but that's, that's how this works. Now to uh, understand a little bit more about this and about how the other notes work in relation to those chords, we need to understand a couple more concepts and that's consonance and dissonance. Consonance is when we have two or more notes that sit well together, they have no tension or little tension, okay? So dissonance is the opposite of that, it's where we've got a lot of tension, where they don't play well together. Uh, so here's an example of consonance, we can take a G, fifth fret of the D string and then an open G, both play together, so it's the same note, in unison, that's consonant, completely consonant, so there's no tension in there at all. To create some dissonance, all we need to do is take that fifth fret there on the D string up to the sixth fret, so we've got a G sharp, G sharp and a G together, there with the open G, D 
dissonant. That's completely dissonant. So you can hear nasty, nasty, nasty. Back to the G and the G. That's okay. Consonant. Dissonant. Consonant. Okay? All intervals have varying degrees of consonance and dissonance. So you can hear it there. Perfect fifth. That's fairly consonant. Fourth. Little bit of dissonance there. Major sixth. Major seventh there. Octave different degrees of it. Some are very consonant, some of them are very dissonant. And it's that dissonance that creates the tension that we use in music. So if all music was made up of consonant intervals, it just wouldn't want to go anywhere because it's the tension that gives us direction. So for instance, perfect fourth there, that dissonance resolves back to that major third. Major sixth resolves back to that perfect fifth. Major seventh resolves back to the perfect octave. So the dissonance in there is what gives us this direction. The tension wants to resolve, okay? So that's where consonance and dissonance comes in. This concept of tension release is pretty much the basis for all music. Certain chords move into other chords because of tensions that want to resolve. So think of the term chord progression. The chords want to progress. They have movement and direction. So listen to this chord progression. through the progression and moved back to the uh, to the root note back to the tonic so and it's it's this that we study in uh, in harmony we study how the consonance and dissonance works so every one of those chords in a key has its own little recipe it has its own little set of dissonances and those dissonances want to resolve so that is resolving to that chord resolving to that chord and then resolving back to the tonic so chord progression the progression is created by tensions that are resolving. So now we know what consonance and dissonance is, we can understand why the chord tones are the first part of call in creating a bass line. The chord tones are all very consonant, and so we know they're gonna be a safe bet when it comes to playing through the progression. We also know that in working through those chord tones, we're gonna to be outlining the chord progression and reinforcing that feeling of movement uh, that I was talking about before. So if I play through that same chord progression again, one, six, two, five in C, okay, we'll just play the arpeggios through there, you'll hear that actual chord progression as we move through there. So here's the chord progression again. We've got C major, A minor, D minor, G major, C. Okay, so that's a one, six, two, five in the key of C major. So if I play those arpeggios, C major, A minor, D minor and G major back to C there we can hear that chord progression we don't have to play the chords we can hear it in the melody in the actual arpeggio there in the bass line okay so there's that movement coming back to the tonic and, you know, on the face of it, that sounds like a pretty mundane, pretty boring exercise, just arpeggios going up and down. But if we add a little spice in there by just changing the rhythm around a little bit, it can actually sound a lot more interesting. Okay, so that's just chord tones. Now, as I mentioned at the start, chord tones don't have to be played in this linear, up and down, stereotypical arpeggio fashion, you know, like this. They can be used as individual, independent items in their own right. So, again, I'll go through the chord progression, and this time, I'm going to just use them one at a time, so that you can see how this works. So, again, C major, A minor, D minor, G, 1, 6, 2, 5 in C. So... I'll just start with the root note. That's always the good first part of call, okay? So. Okay, so just the root notes. Now, if I was to use the octaves, I could bring that into play, okay? So it's the same thing, it's just the root note, just in a different register, okay? So that'll just give us a bit more movement. Okay, so now let's start bringing in some of the other chord tones. So I could start using the fifth in there, okay?
okay? So this is with the fifth of each one, and each one will be a perfect fifth, so just that basic pattern, okay? So. Okay, so that was just with the fifth, and now I could just use the third. Okay, so each time I was just using one of those different chord tones in conjunction with that root note, obviously, uh, to, uh, you know, to just good effect in working through the, uh, the, the uh, chord progression. So at no point there did I start playing, you know, that arpeggio pattern. It's just using chord tones in isolation, just taking them out, just putting them in there, because we know that they're going to be consonant, and each one is going to help to uh, outline that movement. Now, remember, the aim with something like this is to not just randomly use the notes because they're safe, you know. Being safe is not enough. You should learn how each note sounds in relation to the chord behind it, and also how they sound as they move from one chord to another within a key. And to do this, you just have to play and play and practice and practice using the notes and listening to how they sound. You'll gradually develop a musical vocabulary as you assimilate and digest the intervals and you know learn which ones you like. That way you learn to speak through the instrument. You shouldn't be surprised by the notes that you know come out of your instrument as you play them. It shouldn't be random. When you speak, you don't just open your mouth and make random sounds and hope for the best. You learn words and you learn how the words interact to create phrases. And then you develop more and more and you know with experience and development. So you learn how the phrases work and how to you know use a phrase. It's not just random. So now you should understand that the chord tones are the framework and foundation upon which everything else is constructed. But where do the other notes fit into this picture? Well, first of all, let's just have a look at scales. So let's say that we're in the key of C major and we've got a chord playing a C major 7, okay? So there's the chord and we're in the key of C major. So let's have a look at the key first. Let's have a look at the scale there. So we've got a C major scale. So everybody usually knows a C major scale. So we've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, okay? Now let's have a look at the notes of the arpeggio of that C major 7. So we've got C, E, G, B, okay? C, E, G, B. And uh, we could look at those as the intervals 1, 3, 5, 7, or root, major 3rd, perfect 5th, major 7th. And if you look a little closer, you might notice, ah, those notes of the C major 7 arpeggio are there in the C major scale, you know, C, E, G, B. C, D, E, F, G, A, B. They're all in there. Now, a lot of the time, people think of scales as just being these shapes where all the notes are just, you know, of equal importance and then unrelated in a way, you know. So what we can do now is actually see them as, well, see the arpeggio as the skeleton or spine of, this, uh, of the scale and then look at the other notes in there as the non-chord tones. So let's work through it again. So we've got, this is the scale, C major scale. So we've got C, non, uh, sorry, C, chord tone. D, that's a non-chord tone. E, chord tone. F, non-chord tone. G, chord tone. A, non-chord tone. B, chord tone. So when I'm saying chord tone, I mean from the C major seven. So there we have the C, E, G, B, and in between it we had the D, F, and the A. So the first, the third, and the fifth, and the seventh, they're the notes of the chord. The second, the fourth, and the sixth were the non-chord tones. And if you look even closer, you'll notice that they're just bridging the gaps between the chord tones. So if I work through again, we have C, D, E. The D is bridging the gap between the C and the E. Then we've got E, F, G, so E chord tone, G chord tone, F there in the middle, bridging the gap. Then G, A, B, so we've got G and B are the chord tones, the A's in there, bridging the gap. Okay, so C, D, E, E, F, G, G, A, B. So now we can see that that scale is the arpeggio with some non-chord tones in there, bridging those gaps, okay? And all the other scales that you see, this applies to those as well. So if it was a, a Dorian scale, for instance, we can see there that we've got the C minor seven, we've got the notes of the chord, C, E flat, G, B 
flat, and in between we've got the C, D, E flat, E flat, F, G, bridging the gap, G, A, B flat, the A is bridging the gap, and up to the C. So it's just a different way of looking at scales, so we can see that skeleton in there, that framework. Now, you might be wondering why we don't just advocate the use of scales first and chord tones second, especially considering the fact that the scales provide us with so many more options and uh, give us much smoother lines. Well, part of the reason lies in the fact that, as I mentioned before, not all scale notes are equal. Nothing changes the fact that the chord tones, that skeleton, they're the consonant safe notes. So when we play a scale, we still have to see those chord tones as the important notes. Okay, so that's that skeleton of the, uh, of the scale. The extra scale notes, the second, the fourth, and the sixth, they provide a lot of tension and want to resolve back to the chord tones. And that obviously doesn't make them unusable. It actually gives them a lot of power and flavor, uh, but we just have to be careful how we use them. We can't just start randomly playing non-chord tones with no attention to the dissonance that they have because we're gonna start having problems. The best way to approach the use of uh, non-chord tones within scales is by applying them as melodic devices. And this way we get to practice them with some form of purpose. Now a melodic device might be something like a passing tone, or a neighbour note, or a turn, or an approach note. There's loads of different melodic devices and when we analyse music, whether it's bass lines or melodies or even chords, we can see lines as combinations of chord tones and melodic devices working around them. So the first melodic device we'll look at is the passing note. Now the passing note just moves from one chord tone to the next, so it just bridges the gap. And this is exactly the same as what we saw when we worked through the scale. So when we played the C major scale, we had C, D, E, E, F, G, G, A, B. They were all passing notes. So we had C, D, D is the passing note between the C and the E, E, F, G, F is the passing note between the E and the G, A, is the passing note between the G and the B, okay? So that's all it is, just moving between the chord tones. So, let's just make up a few little bass lines just to show how this might work. So the first one, I'll just use the second. So we'll just use the D, okay? So it's between the C and the E, so we've got the notes. And obviously it makes no difference whether we move up or down, so moving up, still both passing notes, okay? So, little bass line. Okay, so again, just a passing note. So, uh, and this is all over a C major seven, by the way. <laughs> so next up, let's use a, an F. So we bridge the gap between the E and the G there. So again, another little bass line. Okay, or we could combine the two. We could also use the A up there between the G and the B, so. Okay, so all of those were just passing notes between them. And remember that all the time we're still looking at the, uh, at the chord tones there, the C, E, G, and B. You know, of the uh, C major seven there, we're still seeing those as our main notes. There are main notes of resolution, the consonant notes. These non-chord tones, are one, we're just passing through them, okay? And that's why they work. That's why we don't have any problems and we don't, you know, have any problems landing on one and having loads of tension because we're resolving them. Now let's look at another melodic device, neighbor notes. Now these are also called auxiliary notes and they're simply created by moving from a chord tone to the next note up or below and back again. So passing notes move from a chord tone to the next chord tone, we bridge the gap, Neighbor notes don't go anywhere. You just go to it and back, okay? And it'll make more sense when I play them, okay? So we've got the C major seven arpeggio again. And so we'll use the second first of all. So we've got the root, second, root, okay? That's it. D is the neighbor note there. We just move up and back. So we could go from the E up to the F. There and back. G to the A. And obviously when we get to the uh, B up there, the seventh, we actually move into the root. Uh, but uh, we can also play them below. So if we did it from the root note, we move down to the seventh and back. E, D, E, G, F, G, B, A, B. Okay? 
Okay, so they're all neighbour notes. So we just move from the chord tone to the next note, either side and back. So here's just a couple of examples of bass lines that could use neighbour notes. So I'll start just with the second there, moving from the C up to the D and back. So we might have... Okay, so just root to the second and back. So now let's try it with the uh, fifth to the sixth. See how we're still emphasizing the chord tones in here, but we're using these non chord tones to create these melodic devices. So now let's just combine both of those. So, Now let's look at approach notes. Now, as the name suggests, an approach note approaches a chord tone, pretty much from out of nowhere. So uh, a passing note moves between chord tones, a neighbour note moves from a chord tone to a non-chord tone and back, an approach note just targets those chord tones, it just approaches. So um, if we move back to the uh, C major 7, so C, E, G, B, we could approach the root note, the C there, from the D. So. Okay, so we're targeting that C there, we're just dropping it in. And there's the uh, tension from the, from the D there, and it resolves as we hit the root note, okay? So for the E there, the third, we could approach from the D, or from the fourth. And for the fifth there, we could approach from the sixth, or from the fourth. And for the seventh, the B, we could approach from the A, so. Now, when I play them like that in isolation, they don't really sound very useful. You know, it just sounds like this strange couple of notes. But when you put them in bass lines, they do, well, they are very common and uh, they are really useful in, uh, in, uh, in bass lines because we're not always going to be wanting to just, you know, play passing notes and neighbor notes. So these, you know, this is a way of just approaching from nowhere. So I'll just play a bass line here that just uses the sixth to the fifth and the second to the first there. So that might sound like this. So I'm using the 6th there to come to the G. So I was on the C, went up to the A, then down to the G. So again, I'm approaching the G from the A, okay? And then I used the D to come back down to the C. Okay, so both of those were approach notes. And like I say, we're targeting the chord tones. Now, there are loads of these melodic devices and variations on them, but the main thing to take away from all this is the way that we can make use of non-chord tones with purpose, rather than just seeing all scale notes as equal in relation to that chord. At first, this way of looking at scales might seem a little over-analytical, especially if you're uh, already used to messing around with scales. But once you start to see the chord tones as this framework or skeleton that we're working around, these melodic devices do make a lot more sense, and you'll soon start to realize that we don't have to be trapped in this what scale works over what chord kind of mindset. Yes, a certain key might heavily push for a particular mode or scale, but as we start to add chromatic notes into the mix, it quickly becomes apparent that we can use pretty much any note around that chord tone framework. It's more a case of what sounds you actually want to create, and that comes from your own musical vocabulary, your personality, and you know your style. And that has to develop naturally over time by practicing and listening, and you know learning how all these licks, lines, intervals, and melodic devices all work in context. Now let's quickly look at how chromatic notes fit into the mix. When we look at the chord tones and scales, we can see that the scales basically fill in the gaps between the chord tones in a functional sense, that is. Well, chromatic notes just go one step further and they fill in the gaps between the scale notes. So let's take a C major seven chord again. If we work up through the arpeggio, C, E, G, B. Now up through the scale, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So that's the C major scale. Now let's put a D flat in there. Okay, so this is the flat and second. So C, D flat, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. So again. Okay. 
okay? Now that's a chromatic passing note. We're passing from the root note there, the chord tone, to the next scale tone, but we're moving via that chromatic note. So it's a chromatic passing note, okay? So again, it's a melodic device. And you'll notice there that it doesn't actually have that much effect on the overall tonality of that scale. Because it's moving in, in, because we're passing through it so quickly, we don't have any time for it to, uh, you know, to sound really dissonant. You know, if we landed on it, you know, as an accented note, you know, then it would sound more uh, dissonant. But because we're just moving through it, it just gives us that smoother, jazzier line there. So we can use them anywhere in there as well. So if we were to move from the Let's go through the scale again, C, D. We could use the E flat in there to move to the E, so. Okay, that one sounds a bit, a bit different when you're coming down. And it's also worth noting that when you use these chromatic passing notes, Sometimes they can sound a little bit uh, smoother or, or they can be a little bit more useful if you're actually approaching the chord tones. So, for instance, the flat and second there is, uh, is better used approaching the actual root note there. So it's better in descent. So, you know, we, we create that tension and then resolve it. I mean, we're still resolving it when we move up because we're landing on the uh, scale tone. It's just that we're not resolving it to the same extent, okay? So as we come up... Okay, so that's the E flat resolving to the E. So it doesn't work as well coming down, but you can, you know, you can use these things however you want, really. So now let's try the sharp and fourth in there. So let's come up the scale again. C, D, E, F, F sharp, G. Again, it doesn't work as well when we're coming down, um, depending on what sound you're going for, obviously. So coming up. Or let's try putting in the flat and sixth in there, or the sharp and fifth, so. That A flat to the A. Okay. And when you combine all these, we can put the fl uh, flat and seventh in there as well. <laughs> we end up with a complete chromatic scale. So, obviously, you don't think of it as a chromatic scale, it's just that we're still, after all of that, working around that skeleton of the actual chord tones, but we're putting in the scale notes and we're putting in the chromatic passing notes, okay? So... Okay. So here I'll just use some examples of those chromatic notes in a basic groove around a B flat seven chord, okay? So... So on a B flat seven, we're going to be playing the B flat seven arpeggio, and uh, the main scale notes in there would be a B flat mixolydian. So that'd be a major second, perfect fourth, and major sixth in there. Just think a B flat major scale with a flat and seventh. Okay. So the basic groove is going to be roughly around this. So that's the root. Flat seventh, and I'm using a chromatic note to move from the flat seventh up to the root again. So, pretty simple movement there. And then I'll just put in the uh, the extra chromatic note. So I might put some in from the uh, sixth down to the fifth, from the root. Uh, sorry, the second up to the third. Which I can also play up the octave, and from the root down to the seventh, and from the fourth up to the fifth. Okay. So, and I'll just move between them. Okay. So with each of those lines, I was careful to use them in passing without drawing too much attention to them. And even though they went by fairly quickly, they still had you know, that desired effect of adding a bit of bluesy or funky or jazzy spice into the mix. 
And you don't have to limit yourself to passing notes. You can try approach notes and you know neighbor notes and all the other types of melodic devices, you know, like enclosures and things like that. And if you analyze the bass lines and licks that you learn in general, you know, like all the stuff that you might be learning just you know, in your practice, it can really improve the quality of your practice and learning because you start to see how those lines work and you can take little fragments of a lick and then apply it as a melodic device into the rest of your playing. So by taking a melodic technique, rather than simply, you know, the notes of a scale or an arpeggio, you can apply it to a lot more aspects of your playing. So just a simple approach note from a sharpened fourth to the fifth, you know, that, that move there can make a big difference because then when you start applying it, because it's just that, that movement there, you can start applying it in loads of different, uh, different parts of your playing. So please like this video and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And as I mentioned before, if you've not been over to TalkingBass.net, then go check it out. There's the lesson material for this lesson and every other lesson over there. And all the videos are set out in a nice categorized manner. Uh, that's all at the lesson map. Also subscribe for free to gain access to all the free bass goodies and resources. Uh, there's loads of exclusive content and general stuff being released all the time. Okay, see you later.